All right, one question which was just raised now and which I think might be worth explaining again briefly in the, because this is a common doubt I have heard within the past as well. Okay. So in yesterday's example that we took, we essentially I drew something like this. Right? And I said, okay, the capacitance at this point is 5 femtofarad, the capacitance at this point is 20 femtofarad and so on. Right? Now, keep in mind, I am putting a dashed line over there for two reasons. One is, this is not an explicit capacitance. It is not a separate capacitor that I am attaching at that point. Okay? It is just something I am using to denote the total capacitance present at that point. Again, that's not entirely correct. It is not the total capacitance. It is the input capacitance of the next phase. Okay, so this 20 femtofarad is the input capacitance of the NAND phase. Not total capacitance at this point. What is the total capacitance at that point, please? 20 femtofarad plus whatever is the parasitic due to the inverter. Okay? So there is some parasitic due to the inverter. I am not specifying that explicitly. The reason for that is because once I give you the input capacitance of the inverter, you know the structure of the inverter, you can know what the output capacitance is going to be. Right? So that 20 does not include the inverter. 20 is only the NAND gate. It is only under that condition that that electrical effort formula that I gave, the next gate divided by self, right? It is purely the next gate, not next gate plus parasitic. The plus parasitic part is taken care of by the plus parasitic term in the delay formula. Okay. So keep that in mind. When we are talking about electrical effort, it is how big is the next gate compared to the present gate. Next stage meaning the input capacitance of that next stage, not the total capacitance which includes parasitic etc. Okay? So just keep that in mind, that's an important observation when you are using these formulas. Again, please, please, please don't try to blindly apply the formula. At any point when you have a doubt, you can always go back to the R into CL expression for actually calculating the delays and work from there. That is fundamentally where all of this is derived from. Right? Do not just blindly try to apply the formulas. The formulas are only secondary. They are there to make your life easier once you are comfortable with how the thing works. Okay? But you need to be sure that you understand how exactly it works in the first place. Alright, what I am going to do today is take a somewhat more complicated example of how we can use this principle of logical efforts to quickly estimate delays in a larger design. Okay? So some parts of this may be a little confusing at first. If you do find it confusing, feel free to interrupt me and let's get it clarified as we are going along. Okay. The problem statement, this is a worked example directly from the book by Veste and Harris. I am repeating it over here because it's a very good example. It sort of illustrates the principle of using logical effort very well. Okay, and I thought sort of stepping through it in class might be useful for a lot of you. Of course, you can also go through it in the textbook afterwards. So, the example itself says something like this. I am going to jump ahead a little bit and say that we have something called the register file. Now, how is the register file designed, how is it built and so on, we have not studied yet. Okay. So, for the time being, all that you need to know is a register file is something that is present in all CPUs, right? Any assembly language that you learn would have learned instructions like add R1, R2, so the result in R3, right? Load something into R5, store something into R3, store something from R6 into memory and so on, okay? So all those kind of instructions are making use of registers inside the CPU, okay? Now, how are those registers actually implemented? They are a bunch of flip-flops. 
As far as this course is concerned, we have not yet studied how to make a flip flop, but you know what flip flops are. They are sequential memory elements. Right? There is a clock signal, there is usually an enable signal which says whether or not you are allowed to write into the flip flop. Okay? And there is some actual data that can be written into the flip flop and also read out of the flip flop. Okay? So the way that the register file works is there will be some data in, data out, and then address. Okay? So if I say that this register file has 16 entries or 32 bits each, what that means is there are 16 different locations, R0, R1, up to R15. So 16 different locations, each one is 32 bits. Okay. Since there are 16 locations, how wide is your address bus? How many bits are there in the address? 4 bits. Right? So this will be from 3 colon 0. This is just a notation. 3 colon 0 is sort of a very long type of notation to show that the index goes from 3 as the MSB, 2, 1 and 0 as the LSB. Okay? D in is going to be how many bits wide? 32. D out? Also 32. Right? So this notation is also something that you will see very often. When I draw a bus, I just put a stroke across it and write the number of bits to indicate that it is that wide. Okay? Now, the crucial part as far as this particular example is concerned is, when you are implementing such a register file, that address, those four bits of address that you give, need to go and select one of the 16 registers. Okay? The enable signal for one of those 16 registers has to be turned on. And all the others have to be turned off. Okay? So once that enable signal for that one register out of 16 has been turned on, you can either write new data into it, or you can take that data and put it through a multiplexer and take it out. Either one can be done by enabling that particular register. Okay. So in other words, there is going to be an address decoder which selects one out of 16 registers. What kind of a gate would you use for selecting exactly one out of 16 different options? Let's say that I wanted to select the option register number 15. This is the address 1111. What gate should it be? What gate will become 1 only when 1111 are all high and 0 at any other time? And gate. Okay. So, at least for register 15 it's clear that it's going to be an AND gate. You put an AND on all the four address bits and you can get that particular address selected. Okay? Now, I'm going to further make the assumption that not only do I have A3, A2, A1, A0, the address bits, I also have A3 bar, A2 bar, A1 bar, A0 bar available to me. Okay, those are already available. Somebody has put an inverter somewhere and already given me that particular output. If that is the case and I wanted to select, let's say, the 10th register over there, A10 or R10, right? That corresponds to the address 10, which is 1010. Okay? So, what does that correspond to? This address is 1010, which is the same as A3 has to be 1, A2 has to be 0, so A2 bar, A1 has to be 1, and A0 has to be 0. 
factor of A. Okay? Why is this branching factor important? Because it's sort of telling you that that initial load, even though it could drive 10 units of capacitance, finally needs to drive an 8-way branch followed by that 96 load. Okay? So a 10 unit capacitance trying to just directly drive a 96 unit load will see an electrical effort of 96 divided by 10. Right? The output load is 9.6 times of the input. Here what we are saying is it is not just 9.6 times of that, it is also multiplied by 8 because the same signal A3 has to somehow get divided into 8. 8 copies of it, 8 branches are being made from that one signal. Okay? So this sort of sets up the phase first. Now we know exactly what the problem statement is. These are all the conditions of our register file. The question is how do I implement a 4 input and k? Okay? So we have options for here. The first thing is that I think gives us options. I am also going to make one further assumption. Either AND or NAND is acceptable. Now you might say that this is not entirely valid because AND has will be 1 when the inputs are correct and all the other inputs, uh, all the other outputs will be 0 whereas NAND will be the other way around. Thing is you can modify that in the register itself and take care of it. Okay, so I am going to consider that either AND or NAND is acceptable. Sorry, can we get a question? Yeah. 9.6 is just this. The output capacitance, each of these registers, right? So each register has 32 bits, 32 flip flops, right? Each flip flop has 3 units of capacitance. That I am giving you. Which means that one decoder line is going to be connected to all 32 of those flip flops. Okay, as an enable signal, right? Which means that the total capacitance connected to that line is 3 plus 3 plus 3, 32 times. So 96. Okay. So 96 is the total output capacitance. What is the input size capacitance? Effectively what I am saying is that my input can drive 10 units of capacitance. Going back to yesterday's example, but like saying my input, my first stage inverter has 5 times of RS of capacitance. Instead of that, I am saying it has 10 units of capacitance. Okay? So, it's as though I have a gate. The input of that gate has 10 units of capacitance, so it has that size. By telling you that it can drive 10 units of capacitance, I am effectively telling you how big the input first stage is. Okay? The last stage which needs to be driven is 96. So, the electrical effort across this stage is output load divided by input load. 96 divided by 10. Okay? Yeah. No, no, I am telling you that the input has to be designed for that. There is a J. You are finally implementing some kind of a J over here, something like this. Okay. This is equivalent to saying, alright, so simplify matters because there is a branching going on over here, what I am going to assume is, I will assume that there is some kind of a buffer sitting over here. Okay. The input capacitance of this buffer is 10 units. The output capacitance here is 96 units. That's it, that's what I am saying. There is an effective load capacitance over here which is 96 units. There is an input stage buffer which is of size 10 units. Whether that is an explicit buffer or whether it is an inverter or whether it is some other part of some gauge that you design is up to you. What you need to take into account is there has to be something which can drive 10 units. So why is this 10 units important? Somebody else is going to be giving you the address for the register file. Okay? 
whoever is designing that unit, let's say it's the instruction decoder unit, from the instruction decoder I am directly getting the address of the register to be accessed. Okay. That instruction decoder will be designed by somebody who says, okay, I have to drive a load of 10 units of capacity. That's all. Okay. So you can design assuming that you can have up to 10 units of capacitance of input. If you could have a bigger input, that is good news for you because it means that the total delay will vary. If I can use very large inverters at the input, that's good because my total delay will reduce. Whatever is the external load will be, the delay due to the external load will be less. The problem is if I use a big inverter at the input, whoever is driving me will have difficulty. Okay. So the 10 units of capacitance is just something arbitrarily that I have put over there for specifying this. Yeah. This one output line is going to be connected to 32 flip flop as an enable signal. Right? So what does that mean? It means that the outputs of all those 32 or rather the inputs to all those 32 don't have separate. This is only the enable signal. to those 32 flip flops. Once I enable them, I can write something into them. So that same decoded line has to be connected to all 32 of them so that it can write data into them. That's all that we are doing. Huh? The branching factor of A comes because that A3 signal, right, is going to be connected to how many and K. Out of total 16 registers, A3 will be used for decoding 8 of them, A3 bar will be used for 8 of them. A2 will be used for 8, A2 bar will be used for 8. Right? So because of that, this signal that I have over here, this A3, which is going through some buffer with 10 units of capacitance, after that it's going to get connected to one AND gate over here, one AND gate here, another AND gate here, another AND gate here, and so on. Total number of those AND gates is 8. So there is a branch, 8 way branch. This is the decoder. What I am building? Huh? No, I am writing into the register file. I am trying to access, see, what is the decoder? A decoder is something which takes some address bit and generates a 1 or a 0 corresponding to whether this particular signal should be activated. What I am constructing, what I am telling you is a decoder is a set of AND gates. And I am trying to construct that decoder. Okay. So what I am drawing over here, that initial buffer followed by the AND gate and the grid structure is the decoder. I am trying to build my decoder. I am trying to build it in such a way that the total delay through it is kept minimal. Right? So, ultimately what we have done in other words is, we have taken this problem, sorry, what is this? Yeah. Right. It doesn't matter. The point is there is no such thing as input capacitance of a NAND gate. Why? Because I can scale the entire gate. I can change all my transistors up by a factor of 2 and the input capacitance will change. Right? So, if I ask the question, what is the input capacitance of a NAND gate? That question by itself is meaningless. I have to specify what kind of NAND gate. Is this a unit size NAND gate? Is this a NAND gate of size 10 or size 5? What do I mean by size 10 or size 5? Usually what I mean is all the transistors have been scaled up by the factor 10 or factor 5. Yeah. No, it, what I am saying is the input scale, I am allowing you to drive up to 10. In reality, you may choose to have a smaller NAND gate or a smaller NAND gate, right? Which does not have 10 units of capacitance. 
that's a possibility while designing it you might finally decide on a on a hand gate which does not actually have ten units of capacity as the designer as the architect i am telling you look you can you can go up to ten units if you go more than ten units you are causing problems for the previous case that's the only thing right so don't go to more than 10 units if you can manage with less than 10 units of capacity and the input that's probably okay because at least you are not bothering the person as a previous case your own delay will increase as long as you can take care of that and meet whatever budget i give you let's say that the decoder is part of your entire logic chain and i tell you you are allowed to take five hundred cycle seconds for decoding right if i give you a number like that and you are able to manage that with whatever smaller capacity and the input good the 10 units is a bound basically saying look don't take this because then you will cause problems for the previous case that okay all right so what we have done over here is taken the problem of designing the decoder right If you think about it, what I could have sort of done over here is done away with this entire explanation and straight away told you design a coding for time. That would have made life simpler. The reason why I went through the entire explanation is to sort of also give you a feel for how these things are practical problems. It's not just a question of designing coding for time. Where do you need to design a coding for time? In the context of a register file. Where do I use a register file inside a CPU? And of course, CPUs are something that are generally designed, right? There are CPUs for cell phones that are being designed every day, right? And Intel, of course, has whole teams working on designing the next generation of CPUs for desktops and tablets and whatnot. Okay. So the point is, your logical effort is not just a toy example that is used for small. Chains of logic that we draw. For our course, mostly we'll be drawing the chains of logic and saying find the optimal delay through this chain. But the point is, you also need to have the connection between this and how it is used in practice. Okay. So with that in mind, one thing you can do if you want is ignore everything that I have said up to now and take the problem. I need to design an anti. Four inputs and gate has to be designed. Okay. The capacitance, maximum capacitance allowed at the input is ten from ten uh, units, and there are eight such Eight and eight. The load at each stage is ninety-six kilo. So this is the problem that we have got to solve. Okay. Question is how do you design an IND gate? Or, like I said, you can also choose to design a NAND gate, a four-input NAND gate. Right. Now, first question: Can you design a four-input AND gate using a single-stage CMOS logic? According to what we discussed yesterday or day before, no. The answer is no. Why? Because it's not an inverting gate, right? The pull-down network has to be such that whenever one of the inputs goes high, the output will go low. Whereas for AND, what happens is only when all the inputs go high, at that point the output will also go high. It won't go low. So four input and cannot be realized using a single stage CMOS logic. How can it be created? Take a four input and then put an inverter after. Okay. So what are the options that we have? And four followed by inverter. Okay. Then there is of course. Just an AND four itself, which will do the job for you. You can create a single stage four input AND gate, 
other any other ways by which you can create a four input magnet. Cascade what? Let's stick to CMOS logic. So, AND gates are out of the question, but NAND, NOR, inverters are all possibilities. Okay? So, can you think of what we want is this. In fact, let's just declare and write it as, okay, let's just leave it as this. Okay? One thing I can do is write it as A dot B dot C dot D double bar. This in turn is equal to A dot B the whole bar plus C dot D the whole bar. Okay? So what is this? First you land A and D. Land C and D. Those things happen in parallel. You nor the outputs of those together and finally invert it. Okay? So it's a two input NAND gate followed by a two input NOR gate followed by an inverter. Okay? This can also be written as AD whole bar dot CD whole bar So what is this? This is effectively telling you NAND2 followed by uh, sorry I need to invert this AB whole bar whole bar again right? So I take the NAND2 I invert the output put it through another NAND2 Ok I could also go further and say make it an AND gate itself so that it's NAND2 inverter NAND2 and another inverter ok there are quite a few options like this that I can write maybe at least another two or three more should be possible ok something in terms of NOR gates and so on right so now the question becomes how do I decide which is the best one? And how do I decide what the sizes of the gates should be for each and every one of these choices? Okay? So this can be a, this is the tricky part. This is the part where I would like to use logical efforts to speed things up as much as possible. I don't want to sit and actually do the entire schematic, do spike simulations, nothing of that sort. I want to be able to fatally estimate what is the delay to each of these gate combinations. Okay. Let's take an example, NAND4 or rather Okay. Let's just take this case, NAND2 inverter NAND2. Okay. So effectively what it's telling us is in other words, the circuit will look something like this. NAND2 inverter Okay. This one will be, for example, the A3 bit. Right? And similarly, there will be seven more toppings of this with A3 going into it. And it copies with a A3 bar. Okay? So this is the circuit that we have. Okay. Now the problem is even more simple. Effectively it becomes the question of I have this circuit.
This is 10 units of capacitance. There is an 8 way branch over here and 96 units of capacitance. Okay? So what is that? There is that uh, yeah, Secondly, what this 8 way branch at this point means is the equivalent capacitance given by this must be 10 by 8 Okay, each individual NAND gate must give only 10 by 8 units of capacitance my first case was an inverter, then I could also have chosen to have the branch after the inverter. Okay, that's also another possibility that I have. In which case my inverter could have had a capacitance directly of 10 units and have the branch after that. It does not matter where the branch is. Right? What matters is, to whoever is looking in from the previous case, the total capacitance seen is only 10 units. How you achieve that? Do you make the individual unit man gate smaller? or you make an inverter buffer stage right at the beginning followed by logic that's up to you ok means what yeah so parallel capacitance is high so the total capacitance must be 10 of those 8 units of the 8 and 8 the 8 and 8 man gates together total capacitance must be only 10 right Looking in from here, from previous case, total capacitance must be 10 units. It cannot be more than 10 units. Okay? So, because the parallel capacitance is high, the individual capacitances must be made 1 by 8 of that so that the total capacitance becomes 10. Okay? Alright, now we have this chain. Effectively what we are saying is I want to find what should be the capacitance at this point, what should be the capacitance at this point. How do I choose this such that my overall load, right? 96 divided by 10 by 8 electrical effort. Right? Must be driven with minimum delay. So for a 2 input NAND case, what is the delay going to be like? G for the 2 input NAND case, the logical effort is How much is it that we calculated yesterday? 4 by 3 H plus the parasitic effort is 2 For the inverter, x plus 1. Okay? So the total delay I'll call this effective input capacitance at each of these cases. Thank you.